Ooh, boob, Graham. That's, that's your monkey sign today? That's a, uh, well, it's not like a monkey. That's actually a gorilla. Oh, because, you know, silverback gorilla. people need to know that um, gorillas are not monkeys. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Do you know the difference between old world monkeys and new world monkeys? Uh, something about the hand, maybe. I know the difference between monkeys and apes. The major easy tell is tails. If it has a tail, it's a monkey. If it doesn't have a tail, it's an ape. That's right. Old world and new world. Aside from the accent. <laughs> and immigration papers. <laughs> how long they've been wealthy. First of all, people need to know that New World monkeys are from the New World, from the Americas, and Old World monkeys are Asia and Africa. You from whose point of view? Anyway. Look at you being humanities oriented. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, there are lots of ways, but one of them is the prehensile tail. Mm -hmm. So the New World monkeys have prehensile tails, meaning that the tails can be used as hands. So you're kind of right with the hand thing. Mm. Yeah, I, I want to start you with a, a factoid today, a fun factoid. Did you know, Graham Sanders, that... Well, we should introduce ourselves. Be, 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 you know, people oh, don't always know who we are. That's true, because yeah. this might be some people's first episode. That's right. What are they thinking? <laughs> and their last. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are, you are Dr. Graham Sanders, a professor at an unnamed university mm -hmm. uh, at which we're currently sitting. Um, I a, play the role of the educated lay that person. Because <laughs> we both had educated lays and some uneducated ones as well. And you're the self-professed scientist. Self-professed. <laughs> Maybe even self-taught. <laughs> well, I want to start you off with a factoid. Okay. You're going to love this. Did you know that the blood from a human erection oh, God. has enough blood to keep... It didn't take you long. ...has enough blood to keep three gerbils alive? <laughs> but the follow-up question is, alive for what? <laughs> oh, man. You mean just volume-wise enough to fill three gerbils? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many variables here, but anyway. That's true. Yeah. That's true. And, I, I, you know, and um, some of us have, you know, uh, enough for maybe one and a half gerbils because we're not as endowed as others. So before we go Moving on to right the, the meat, so to speak, of yeah. today's presentation, I, w I want to um, have a mea culpa. Uh -huh. In the previous uh, episode, I I'd, I was running on 90 minutes sleep, that's my mm -hmm. excuse, and mm -hmm. I was forgetting certain things. So you would ask me what an open label study is, mm -hmm. and of course I know what that is. My brain just froze. And, I and just you thought were, it was early onset dementia. Well, there's me. that too, which is relevant to today's topic. Ah. Ah. Um, and you were correct in saying that open label studies are those in which the participants know whether or not they're getting the treatment or the ah, placebo. There you go. Yeah, you One correct. for Graham. Not that I'm keeping score or anything. <laughs> he just wrote down a score, by the way, people. He is keeping score. So um, today, we're kind of. I kind of want us to talk about um, this thing, this magical juice that we're imbibing. Oh, right wait now. a minute. Um, we. I was going to come up with a motto. Oh, all right. For the show, and okay. this is not something else that we can maybe throw out to the our listener. All right. Um, I was thinking, science monkey, we make science fun. Key. Okay. <laughs> wow, it's, it's pretty lame. Um, so I want to talk today about this magical juice that we're imbibing, what I call learning juice. And this learning juice is sweet, sweet coffee, my coffee. friend. Sweet, sweet coffee. Well, because coffee I don't like is always mine in the news. Sweet, but... Well, coffee is always in the news, and coffee has really been with us not that long historically. I mean, you're the historian, sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been with, what, 500 years in civilization? Sure. Because it comes from the Let's new world, I believe. Yep. Yeah. And uh, later on in today's uh, ridiculous and rigorous segment, we'll talk a little bit about, about coffee studies. But um, there's always competing studies in the news around, is coffee good for you or bad for you? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Um, good for you. I like to think that it's good now, for you. Now, is that an example of confirmation bias, that it, it corresponds to your personal values? So you're going with that uh, conclusion? And, uh, yeah, and I enjoy it. Um, and I drink it in moderation. And I'm a big believer in all things in moderation. Even moderation? Yes. Yeah. All right. Interesting, interesting. Well, yeah, I, I, it seems to me that the, the weight of evidence seems to be shifting towards coffee is, on average, better for you. And I've seen some stats that suggest that coffee is the, the major source of antioxidants for the American population, hmm. since Americans don't, uh, don't eat that well in general. What are, what are other sources of antioxidants? Uh, tea. Okay. Um, uh, pills. <laughs> Antioxidant supplements. Vegetables. <laughs> Vegetables, exactly. <laughs> be one of those days. <laughs> Remember to drink your coffee. That's right. So I'm looking at a study right now that suggests that two cups of coffee can reduce the risk of, of liver disease. Um, do you know what civet coffee is? Mm -hmm. What is it? That's uh, coffee made from beans that have passed through the gastrointestinal tract of a large cat. Yeah, civet is a um, sort of a cat. It's not really is a cat. Is it a new world cat or an old world 
Well, I don't know if it's penis is prehensile. Who? What? Okay. Who said that? And can it maintain the two gerbils? I'm not sure. Um, so, in fact, I'm reading another article how uh, scientists are trying to copy the taste of civet uh, coffee using uh, all kinds of chemical names. Really? Yeah, it's a whole new, uh, uh, it's a whole new uh, world. Um, okay, so this is my question for yeah. you. Um, there are other studies, coffee and cancer of the pancreas is one that we were looking at here that increases your chances. Um, they never quantify really from what, right? So you just said drinking two cups of coffee, I assume a day mm -hmm. reduces your risk, risk of right. liver cancer. That's right. You're asking about what does mechanism. that mean? No, yeah. no. What does that mean? It means that of... compared to those who do not, what risk epidemiologically is incidence. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. So it means starting from none, uh, how many new cases can we expect in a population? That's mm -hmm. the risk. Mm -hmm. So if you have a population that's not drinking coffee versus one that is drinking coffee, the one that is drinking coffee presumably will have fewer incident cases manifest over a period of time than the one that isn't. Mm -hmm. right? So that's technically how we define risk in population mm -hmm. sciences. And supposedly they're controlling for... People are drinking coffee instead of drinking alcohol, and therefore they have uh, lower liver. One assumes controlling is done. Now, when we get to our rigorous or ridiculous, I'll mm -hmm. give an example of how controlling kind of fails a bit mm -hmm. and gives us a, a spurious uh, example. So, I mean, with coffee, there are all kinds of interesting things that pop up. I mean, what does it mean to be good? It's good because it gives us some benefits, but it's bad in some ways. For example, it, apparently it can leach out calcium mm -hmm. from, from your system, um, from your spinal bone if you drink more than a certain number of cups of coffee. So with, with uh, post-menopausal women, it could be a risk factor. And apparently, I suppose, if you're drinking at certain times of the day, or if you're drinking it instead of drinking something else rather than and right. something else. I, mean, I knew of a guy uh, way back when who had serious, uh, how should I put this, um, fluidity in his gastrointestinal tract. Mm -hmm. And he went to see his doctor asking, Doc, why am I, why am I uh, effluent so mm -hmm. liquidy and not solid as others are? <laughs> And the doctor asked him, so, um, show so, far. <laughs> so after I asked him, uh, well, how, how much coffee are you drinking? He says, you know, three or four a day. Well, three or four cups. Well, dial that back, like one or two. He says, oh, not cups, pots. Three or four pots yeah, a day. That would so, do it. Well, when we talk about coffee, I'm also reminded of the other thing that goes along with coffee mm -hmm. for a lot of people, mm -hmm. and that's smoking. Mm -hmm. And we all know that smoking is bad for you. But is it? Because one of the things we tend not to talk about in mm -hmm. public health is that there are actually some benefits to smoking. Really? Yeah, it's a, a protective exposure for some things like Parkinson's disease and possibly huh. Alzheimer's. Now, the question is, is that because of its association with coffee drinking? Or is it all the lively chats you're having with your friends? Right, as you how you disentangle all that. Break, smoking break. There are, in fact, there are a lot of really well-designed studies that suggest that smoking is protective against certain kinds of neurogenitive disorders. Because of the nicotine? or I don't know the mechanism. Hmm. Let's head right, right to our ridiculous and, and okay. rigorous then, because we're looking sure. at those, those couple of papers. So the, the first one uh, I sent you was the coffee one, and it's mm -hmm. it's one that I show my students all the time. Let me bring it up right here. You've got in front of you. Uh, I'm in front of a computer. I just have the first page. Well, I was lazy of you. Coffee and cancer of the pancreas. I'm stimulating how most people would... Absorb a study if, if right. they look at it. Let me get the background of the study. So this made the news back in the day when it first came out in the early 80s. And I learned of it in uh, my graduate uh, classes. I was doing a PhD in epidemiology. And um, it was brought to us as an example of profound selection bias. Ah. So um, the conclusion from the study is that there is an association, there's that word again, mm -hmm. between drinking coffee and getting cancer of the pancreas. And the design is something called a case control study. Now what that means, well, the case control study is you find people who have the disease, in this mm -hmm. case pancreatic cancer, mm -hmm. you find people who don't have the disease, mm -hmm. and you look through the medical records or you ask them, how much coffee have you drunk in the past? Oh, so this is all just done historically? Yeah, more or okay. less, yeah. And, uh, and then you see if, if the, the percentage uh, who drank coffee in mm -hmm. the past amongst the pancreatic cancer patients right. is higher than those uh, who don't have pancreatic cancer, we conclude that there's an association between mm -hmm. drinking coffee and pancreatic cancer. And is this the value of those big longitudinal studies where they follow a huge cohort for it's the opposite. many decades? It's the opposite. And so, they go back and look at associations? Or? No, it's the opposite. So longitudinal studies move forwards in time. We okay. begin assessing the exposure and look to see if the disease manifests. But right, well, but if we're at year 30 in a longitudinal study, can't we go back and yeah. look at, ask questions that we didn't uh, You could. Design? It's, it's, it's not a longitudinal study, study at that point. It's okay. A, it's a retrospective study. Okay. So um, the trick with these case control studies... This is another thing for a glossary, longitudinal versus retrospective. Yeah. Uh, right. 
um, with a, a, a longitudinal study has enough blood to support things, several gerbils. <laughs> Gerbils. <laughs> Before the end of this podcast, you're going to work a joke about gerbils and diarrhea together, but I don't, I don't want to be there when that happens. The joke <laughs> writes itself if you stop and think about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Let's not. Okay. Richard Gere coffee. Back. So, um, <laughs> Back to the coffee. Makers. So with the problem with the case control study is, is how do you select the controls? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell you how they selected their controls, and you tell me what the issue is. Okay. So there, the cases here are people with pancreatic cancer. In general, the rule is you select the controls. 369 patients, according to this. That's correct, yes. And they have 644 controls. Okay. In general, you want controls to be as similar to the cases as possible, except for that one thing that we care about. The cancer, right? So they chose their controls from, I believe, um, the same hospital ward where the pancreatic cancer patients are, mm -hmm. except they didn't have pancreatic cancer. They had right. some other kind of stomach disorder. Okay. And they asked them, did you uh, drink coffee or not? And, and they did their bit. And they found, of course, a strong association. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, what is wrong with the selection of controls that mm -hmm. cause them to have what is a spurious association? Huh. It's not obvious. So they could picked... They picked from a hospital ward as well? Is that relevant? Um, yeah, it is relevant. Okay. And that's pretty, pretty typical, by the way. Right. So they just don't go out of the general population. That's right, because you want people who have the same diet, the same age profile, the same doctors, mm -hmm. to remove confounding factors. Hmm. Off the top of my head, I don't know what would be wrong with it's, that. It's not obvious, right? So the problem is that the other people in the stomach ailment ward mm -hmm. probably have stomach diseases that prevents them from, from drinking, drinking coffee. coffee. Uh -huh. As a result, the controls have an unusually low rate of coffee drinking. Mm -hmm. So the pancreatic cancer patients have probably a normal rate of cancer drinking, and so the coffee, association coffee. is okay. skewed. Mm -hmm. It's artificially skewed because the controls have an unusually low rate of coffee drinking. I see. Okay. Right. And subsequent studies have confirmed that there is no association between coffee and these right, cancers. Right, right. So it would be more convincing using my idea, not an original one, but how would you design it to be a better study rather right. than what's wrong with this current study? It would make more sense if you went out and got people who drank a lot of coffee, maybe people who drank four cups of coffee a day, and then people who drank no cups of coffee, and then people who were in the middle, and then... That would be like a, a dose response. Mm -hmm. We call that dose response kind of study, where you we have a, a scaled um, exposure. That would be, to my mind, one way you would actually start isolating coffee is what's sure. causing it. That's right? one approach we would take mm -hmm. typically. Yeah. Right. And probably, I didn't read the details of the study today, mm -hmm. but typically they may have had an element of, sca of scalism as well, right. as well. So I have a question. Uh, in the abstract, they say, uh, relative risk associated with drinking up to two cups of coffee per day was 1.8. Right. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means um, we said that risk is the incidence, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the uh, the incidence rate of people getting pancreatic cancer mm -hmm. in this group is uh, the, the risk right. of, of, of getting uh, cancer in the other group is this. If I divide those two, that's the relative risk. Mm -hmm. So if I divide any two numbers and I get one, mm -hmm. they're the same number. Same, yeah. Right. So if it's greater than one, we say there's a positive risk. Mm -hmm. If it's less than one, it's a protective factor. Mm -hmm. And the question we ask ourselves all the time is, what number tells me that something important's happening? is happening? Important. In general, we say it's like 1.5. Right. Yeah. So in and this that, case, the particular term for that is significant, right? I mean, well, that's not. That's yes. That's a kind of significance. Or is there another word for it? People often t uh, think about significance as being statistical significance. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. not quite what we're talking about okay. yet. It's the magnitude of the effect that we're talking about right, here. Right. So the magnitude of the relative risk, in this case, is 1.8, you said? Mm -hmm. Right? 1.8 is pretty high. That's for two cups. For yeah. three cups, they said it goes up to 2.7. Right. So that's like that's d tripling your risk, mm -hmm. essentially, mm -hmm. of getting pancreatic cancer. But... If my risk over my lifetime is really quite low, right. if I triple it, am I really talking about you something? You are that... absolutely right, my friend. Yeah, yeah. So that's the difference between absolute risk versus mm -hmm. relative risk. Mm -hmm. The example I give my students all the time is this. Uh, back in the 90s, there was a year when uh, the risk of cholera mm -hmm. in Ontario went up 300%. And everybody right. freaked out. Mm -hmm. It went from one case to two cases, mm -hmm. or three cases, whatever it might be. Right. Right? So um, the absolute measure is the number of cases. Mm -hmm. The relative measure is the ratio between right, the right, two. Yeah. So it's a, a humanistic, a qualitative choice of mm -hmm. which measure we choose to, to It present. would be useful if in science reporting they always reported the absolute along with the, that is correct. the percentage. I agree entirely. Yeah, Because if I, if I saw that it went from three cases to six, right. that <clears throat> out of 10,000, mm -hmm. 
that wouldn't bother me as much as I doubled my chances of getting this. So one example of this is the recent study that showed that eating bacon is bad for you, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it increases your risk profoundly, mm -hmm. but the, the risk to begin with is quite low. Mm -hmm. We can cover that topic uh, actually in a future episode. Okay, good. Eating bacon. Right on. So we move on to the other other paper because that's a pretty good one too. The mathematics one? Yeah. Okay. So that one's not obvious. This, yeah, this one really threw me actually. A computer application to mathematics. That was the, the full title right. of the paper. And look at the title of the journal. The journal is called Computers and Mathematics with Applications. With application. Exactly the same thing. <laughs> By the way, listeners, if you want to access these papers, go to the website sciencemonkey.ca and it'll be uh, linked for you. Mm hmm so um, when you read a chunks of this, uh, what's the first thing that popped out to you? You know, I hope on sciencemonkey.ca we don't have missing links. Woo! <laughs> Nicely played, sir. Nicely played. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Back to this. Uh, what's the first thing that popped out of me? Yeah. Uh, some of the <laughs> language was odd. <laughs> Right. They, they said, in this work, the authors derived the preliminary result and sincerely proposed the open problem by using a physical phenomena. Right. Like, if they can't write coherent English, I'm not I'm yep. a little bit worried about the actual... S stop right there. Stop study. right there. You're absolutely right. So a um, little background. This is a, a paper published in an Elsevier journal. Elsevier is one of the leading... Boo, Elsevier. Yes. Yeah, there it is. So they, yeah. have, they have political issues that are mm. problematic. We can talk about that in a future episode. Exploiters. Right. So it's a genuine journal. With peer review and everything. They don't have lawyers, do they? <laughs> we must know one or two. I don't know. <laughs> um, they work pro bono. <laughs> I, I, pro bono chimp. I like, was going to say that. Sorry. Damn you. <laughs> um, so I believe this paper was retracted mm, okay. uh, because it's clearly nonsensical. Right. It's random words. It is random words. Yeah. Was it generated by a random computer? It may have been. And in fact, I, I don't believe these two authors exist. I think okay. they might be fake individuals. So this was all a joke? Uh, it might have been. No one's quite sure what happened, except mm. it was published, and it's unclear how it got through the peer review process. Right. So they call it an administrative error, quote unquote. But it's not. But even the introduction, geometry is the second field of mathematics. It is the extension of number theory. There is no exact period for the origin of classical ge It's just very... It's simplistic, yeah. straightforward, but and not really saying anything. It's kind of. I right. was baffled by this, and I thought maybe it was a lack of mathematical knowledge. But I'm glad it was just. Nonsense. I suspect uh, the peer reviewers probably were scared as well. Right. I, I can't. I'm not smart enough to understand this. Mm. So um, I was going to like go off on a tangent about fake papers in general. But mm. We should say that for later. There uh, was a, a reverse case of that where a scientist made a fake postmodern theory paper oh. and got it published. It was actually kind of a. I mean, was that a bit of a joke, though? Yeah, he was totally. He he had no patience for humanities, particularly postmodern theory, critical theory. So he just wrote a bunch of gobbledygook that sounded like postmodern theory to him. Submitted it to a journal, and it was published. Which tells us that that postmodern theory is gobbledygook. <laughs> well, then of course, the postmodernists started talking about the role of discourse and theory and nonsense, and what does it really mean to wow? Be they they, they doubled down on postmodernism. They did, yeah. They just absorbed that's, it. That's it's impressive. like capitalism; it absorbs whatever you know. You know it comes so you're saying um, humanities uh, scholars are in fact uh, intellectual amoebas, mm, exactly phagocytes, protozoans. Yeah. I'm just throwing words out there. <laughs> um, shall we move on to Did You Know? Did You Know? It's, Did You Know? It's rapidly becoming my favorite uh, feature. <laughs> so, uh, you... Am I asking you questions or are you asking me questions? Why don't I ask you questions? All right, sure. Start, and then you can ask me questions the next episode. All right, cool. Um, By the way, we should have some theme music here, right? So, um, oh, yeah. Let's pretend there's some theme music starting now. Hey. <laughs> That was some excellent theme music, right? <laughs> that, that, that was my attempt to musically capture, you know, a quizzical attitude. But, okay. <laughs> um, here we go. So this, I, I, a theme emerged from these questions mm. after I put them together uh, about how to measure things. How, how do we measure things? So which is a, a key feature of science, I think, that you already came up in some of our discussions. But So I'm going to give you per the format that we used last time, a uh, question and then three possible answers. Ooh, I think it's otherwise known as multiple choice. Which, Ooh. by the way, I'm very jealous that all my science colleagues are able to make exams that are multiple choice and then have these Scantron things and have a computer grade them. I mean, that, that doesn't seem like real grading. It's almost like we're able, we're able to solve a problem mm. using the technology at our disposal. Right, yes. Like so that. how would I do that in <laughs> humanities? <laughs> Google Translate to grade my essays. I, <laughs> I think the solution is outsourced to India. Mm. 
Well, we saw this. Uh, what happens with this computer in mathematics? Uh, <laughs> we can outsource this podcast, India. This came. Yeah, this true. We could. Maybe we have. I am Graham Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> this is my. I, I'm Indian people. I can say that. Uh-huh, so. right. <laughs> You're allowed to traffic and stereotypes. That's right. Being a living one yourself. Wow. Well, I don't even know what that meant. So. It's good though. Um, okay, so here we go. First question. Mm. Question the first. Question the first. There is enough DNA in an average person's body to fill three gerbils to stretch how long? A, the length of the Great Wall of China. I had to throw that one in there, sure. of course. B, from the sun to Pluto and back 17 times. Or C, to the bottom of the Marianas Trench and back 127 times. Hmm, that's interesting. So um, I, I know that there's enough... Um, intestinal lining to cover a football field. Okay, well, how many... Oh, that's a, that's a good one to know. Yeah. Uh, uh, how many DNA molecules are in each cell? I don't know. I'm going to guess uh, several hundred thousand. Um, and we have you know, several million cells, mm-hmm. tens of millions, not hundreds of millions. Um, and the length of a DNA molecule actually does does vary depending mm-hmm. upon its its state of meiosis and mitosis. So um, my first I thought was that you're going to say to the moon and back. Mm-hmm. The Great Wall of China is not long enough. Right. I'm going to say Marinus Trench. Marinus Trench. No, from the sun to Pluto. Get out. And back 17 Get times. Out. Yes. Isn't, that's crazy. I'm going to nerd out on you a second because, you know, Pluto has this strange orbit. Mm-hmm. It's, it's sometimes close, sometimes right. far. Okay, the average. Okay, yeah. damn you. Damn you. Damn you um, for having an answer for me. <laughs> well, anyway, because <laughs> we're talking about a very, very variable length. Because yeah. uh, from 500,000 to 2.5 million nucleotide pairs, mm. um, DNA, DNA molecules of this size are 1.7 to 8.5 centimeters long when uncoiled. Or about five centimeters on average, which begs the question: like, if you measure a DNA molecule, mm-hmm. when is a DNA, DNA molecule ever uncoiled? Like, what are you measuring at that point? Uh, if yeah, it comes I in guess. a coiled state, then you're measuring by, the, the, uh, the distance traveled if you were to walk along it. Right. We, yeah, okay. I suppose it seems to kind of be cheating if you start uncoiling them. But anyway, right. and it's uh, just a very inefficient way to get a Pluto as well. How many cells are in the human body, roughly? In a number. Your human body. Yeah. Are there choices here? <laughs> well, I'm I'm just doing the math. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. This is still the DNA question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. 37 trillion. So that's where they did the math. It's the number of cells, which is crazy, right? It's 37 trillion times any number. I, I, I was off. We'll get you to Pluto and back. 10,000. 10, I understand. Okay. So anyway, some total length of two times 10 to the 14th meters are enough for 17 Pluto round mm-hmm. trips. You know, when I was in high school, we had a, um, entered a citywide contest mm-hmm. to estimate things. Right. We're an estimator team. We actually won. Mm. And the question is like this. So clearly I've lost that skill since ah, then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, the, actually, the most fascinating anecdote I heard about estimating, which is about how markets work, is the, when they would you know guess the weight of a bull at a country fair, and whoever guessed it could win a certain mm-hmm. amount of money. And everyone was wildly off. But this one guy asked if he could have all the guesses afterwards. Right, he and, it went, and he averaged it out, and it was yeah. like very close. And that happened again and again and again. I actually do that in my stats class. Yeah. But I, well, some classes, um, uh, sometimes I forget. So you pass a big jar of jelly beans around mm-hmm. in the class and right. have them guess the right. number, and they take the average, mm-hmm. and the average is usually pretty close to the wow. truth. So we need to ask, I need to ask these questions of a, a large group of people. Yeah. But I just got you. So. And there's a variety of biases, sorry, and actually, there's a variety of biases there. There's one called the anchoring bias. Mm-hmm. So if I were to, right. you ever heard about this? Yes, yeah. So whoever posits the first number, then everyone clusters around that Precisely number, right. right. Yeah. So it's not a foolproof method mm-hmm. of getting okay. to the truth. Okay, second question. This one I've found fascinating myself. How long... Okay, first of all, let's set it up. This is, this is, this is relatively general knowledge. Okay. How long does it take a photon to travel from the surface of the sun to the Earth? Um, eight minutes. Eight minutes, that's right. So, and we're talking about a distance of... 90 million miles. One astronomical unit, right? right. Um, which is 149.6... Uh, million kilometers. Million kil- kilometers. And, of course, that's an average because mm-hmm. the, the orbit Orbitary, varies. Right. Okay. Eight minutes to travel, 150 million kilometers. So how long does it take a, that photon to travel from the core of the sun to the surface of the sun before it leaves the surface of the sun? Right. That's a complicated question. And that's the distance I'll give you, 696,600 kilometers. Uh, how many Wait, ages? wait. I have to give you the, the options. Okay. Good. Yeah. So I'm going to give you three different lengths of time. The same length of time, okay, so the photon uh, going from the core of the sun to the surface takes the same length of time as it takes you to drink a milkshake. Or I drink your milkshake. That would mm. be faster. 
Um, that sounds gonna, inappropriate. Go I'm going to put a, a, a film illusion into every one of our episodes. You can spot them <laughs> a around. thin film of illusion. <laughs> <laughs> On top of the milkshake. <laughs> now will you drink it? Okay. Or B, same like the time that it takes for a student to ask if what you just mentioned in class will be in the exam. <laughs> Very short time. <laughs> Or C, the same length of time, approximately, as as long ago as when Neanderthals went extinct. Okay, here's how I'm going to deal with this. Right. This is not simply a question of the speed of travel of a photon. Mm-hmm. I believe there are issues of absorption mm. and re-emission and reabsorption, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Because there is a dense pockets of gas inside the sun. Right. Um, light actually travels slowly through dense objects because of absorption and re-emission. Mm-hmm. So I'm actually going to say something... Probably that I shouldn't say. I'm going to go for the longest option here, the Neanderthal one. And you'd be correct. Look at that. Yeah. Yay, science. Hashtag once, science. Once again, hugely variable number. Right. It could take tens of thousands of years. Neanderthal supposedly went extinct about 40,000 years ago. That's mm-hmm. one number they gave. But it could even take millions of years for the photon to reach the surface, precisely because of what you said, of absorption and, and re-emission. Hashtag science. Yes, very good. <laughs> um, so... It's very stale sunlight by the time it gets to us. So it's, oh, I feel so cheated. <laughs> Unlike this fresh wow. coffee. <laughs> we should get a coffee sponsor. Hmm. Right, anyway. <laughs> this delicious tasting, uh, robust, fresh Kenyan grind. <laughs> Non-civic coffee. Okay. I prefer my coffee to not have come any into contact with the inside Can of film? a civet myself. Oh, I see. Okay, third question. Are we running over time? Or? Whatever. Okay. okay. We, we own the show. We do we want. This one is not multiple choice. Okay. This one, once again, these are all about how you measure things or how you classify mm-hmm. things. What is the largest living entity on Earth? All right. That's an interesting question. Oh, I have to, no multiple choice. You said no choice. No multiple okay. choice, yeah. So it depends be on obvious how you, you define choices. things, right? So um, there are bushes that I know mm-hmm. that are... that <laughs> <laughs> Many bushes among your acquaintances. <laughs> that expand for miles, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, um, the Great Barrier Reef could be considered a single life form. Um, the biosphere itself can be considered a life form by some people. Mm. I'm going to go for asking what is the biggest one or how big is it? No, what is it? We could talk about how big is it, but yeah. just and easy there, question. What is the largest living entity? So it's it's going to be something either, uh, it won't be an animal. Mm. Uh, it, so it won't it, be a great blue whale. No, it, it may not be. I heard recently the great blue whales are the largest creatures that ever lived, yes. bigger than any dinosaur. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, I heard that Bigger than well. Brontosaurus. Um, the Nausilicious. Or the Allosaurus. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, I'm going to go at the Great Barrier Reef. You're right. Woohoo! Yeah. Hashtag yeah. science! <laughs> <You're> <laughs> <done> very well. <laughs> <laughs> Two out of three, in fact. I should have gotten that Pluto. No, there's no way in hell I would have guessed Pluto. There's no way. 17, 17 times. That's times. what freaked me out. There's- yeah. That's got to hurt to have your DNA stretched out like that. But. Or maybe it's quite relaxing. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I'm doing something called nerve flossing where I stretch my sciatic nerve. Well, I don't stretch it. I move it. Right. Apparently, it's bad for your nerve if yeah. you stretch it. But. I've only tried butt flossing. The nerve uh, flossing is man. Up. Okay. Right. Actually, that comes up with the uh, other study we're going to look at. But In the anyway. next episode. Um, well, you know, we're at like 29 minutes. It's not bad. That's not bad at all. Yeah. So uh, just to give you sure. the figures... Um, the Great Barrier Reef spans more than 2,000 kilometers in length and covers kilometers. an area... Kilometers. Kilometers, sir. Say it right. Kilometers. <sighs> kilometers. Oh. kilometers. And, and covers an area of some 350,000 square kilometers. Kilometers. <laughs> you say centimeters? You Which say is... kilograms? <laughs> <laughs> so what do I do? <laughs> Decimeters. <laughs> Millimeters. <laughs> I like that. I could just say that from the room. <laughs> it is the largest living structure on Earth. So that's how they get around it. They call it a sure. structure. Because what is it made up of? Is it one entity or not? Uh, that's a good question. Or is right? each coral polyp its own little... Well, coral, I don't know. I, I mean, the, we're into um, syntax here at this point, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and how we define life is so mm-hmm. is so skewed by our individual experiences in life. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's unreasonable. Have you been a coral polyp? Just the one time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think it's... In- incorrect to think about the biosphere as a single organism right, i think right. it's defensible mm. you know especially if you're an alien coming here i mean i've always wondered would an alien coming to earth actually distinguish between different kinds of life things would have to be connected though right the, the argument here is the mm. coral polyps are actually connected sure connective tissue am i connected to you i mean 
you know, <laughs> I think all living things, right not to be a little, you know, Gaiac and spiritual, mm -hmm. are physically connected through the exchange of, of right. literal uh, food energies. Mm -hmm. okay. So it depends on your perspective. By the virtue of the fact that we're breathing the same air and drinking the same water. Yeah, exactly. And everything. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a very positive note. To end on. Look at that. So, uh, gentle listener, if you have are, any comments for us. We are all connected. Uh, leave some comments for us at sciencemonkey.ca and uh, tune in for our next episode. Oop, oop, great. <coughs> <Right on. coughs>